Oh, hello. Such a fine pleasure to see you again. Welcome back to the Gallery of Curiosities. I remain, as always, your humble host, Osgood. Well, things are starting to get back to, hmm, well, not normal, per se. More like things were in the before times. The chorus is in fine form this evening. They have not played the theme music in over a year. Allow me to check in on them for just a moment. What's gotten into you, eh? Hmm? Did Leopold forget to feed you? Ah, I see. He did not know what to feed you. I suppose I should have left more detailed instructions. Allow me to get our guest started on the story, and then I shall see what I can scare up for comestibles. This evening's exhibit comes by way of Jonathan Duckworth, who is a completely normal, entirely human person with the right number of heads in everything. He received his MFA from Florida International University. His speculative fiction work appears in Pseudopod, Beneath Ceaseless Skies, Southwest Review, Tales to Terrify, Flash Fiction Online, and elsewhere. He is a PhD student at University of North Texas and an active HWA member. It will be read for us this evening by Mr. David Alt. Silver Gloom by Jonathan Duckworth Is there another life? Shall I awake and find all this a dream? There must be. We cannot be created for this sort of suffering. As spume rises from the ocean's churn, these words recrudesce to the surface of the consumptive poet's mind. Sickly John has awoken in the small hours, not from any judder or groan or tremor of the ship. The Maria Crowther is as still as a coin on a pane of glass on these becalmed Portuguese waters, but rather from the protestations of his interior sea, the lifting tides in his lungs that bring the cough. Somehow the others who share the cabin have kept their sleep. The gentle diminuendo of their breathing fills the air. His friend Joseph, the kindly captain, plump Mrs. Pigeon, even his fellow consumptive, lovely Miss Cottrell, seem immersed in the spell of impenetrable sleep. Shuddering, sweating from every pore, John abides a time on his berth, just a little coffin small coffer built into the hull of the ship. He and the others are each cashed like a bee in their own comb, but without any of the sweet gold liquor enjoyed by those apian nymphs. How far he feels now from the joy of the daylight hours when he watched whales drifting languidly through the silken blue waters. How far he feels from his poetry, from the vibrant impulse that only weeks ago addressed his bright star in words that sang from the page. How advanced his aching atoliation, his inexorable skid, seems. There's nothing for it. Weak as he is, he feels entombed by the breath of his cabin mates and by the stale dark of the hold, and troubled enough to rise on his feet. He is quiet, first collecting his shoes and then feeling his way to the door. As the door hinge creaks, a voice, that of his friend Joseph, dreamy, mutters through the dark, John? But John does not stop. She is such a small ship, the Maria Crowther, that he overhears the sailors quite chatter above decks. He liked the ship's name when he first heard of her, her wholesome English character, calling to mind a courteous country maid. She is not a passenger ship, this twin-mast brig, but built for freight, 
chartered to ferry England's finest coal and its most sophomoric poetry to Naples. Soon he is on the deck, where the cool northerly night breeze, insufficient to fill the sails but enough to grace him, soothes his nerves and aches more than any elixir of mercury could. How it thrills him to think of the long sojourn those winds take from the hollows of brooding arctic glaciers. Relief is a brief blossoming, as soon the cough shakes him, and the pair of sailors keeping watch midship turn to regard, and then just as soon forget about him, returning to their briar pipes and each other's laconic society. When he looks up, the night sky is like a field of driven snow, only not white, but the pale silver of ashes. There is one gap in this field, and through it a blot of stelliferous black frames the waxing moon. John follows its rays to the glint on the rail of the ship's bow, and that is when he sees her. For a blink, John imagines it is Miss Cottrell, out for a walk in the fresh air like himself, for the figure at the prow has the selfsame litheness and grace as the ailing woman, but he recalls with a shudder that Miss Cottrell is still asleep, and that anyway she could not have come above decks without getting by him. There are only two women on the Maria Crowther, and both are now in the cabin. Who, then, does he now see reclining against the rail of the prow? A long, sinuous appendage gauzed in diaphanous silk beckons to him, and John feels his feet move before he quite makes the decision to approach. But even once he is aware of his own motion, he doesn't stop. Too curious, too entranced by the shimmer of moon on the woman's naked hair. The sailors watch him pass scarcely with a glance. Why are they untroubled by the woman's presence? They seem not to notice her. He draws near, and the woman lowers her hand and tilts her head with its pointed elfin physiognomy, and the silver gloom of the false sun limbs the bones of her face and the shape of her eyes and lips, and John feels something like a physical blow to his chest. Miss Braun, he says, voice cracking as if her presence should devolve him to a stripling state. It's love, not death, that needles him. Were he in the full rose of health, his love would make him ill just the same. But it isn't Miss Braun, his bright star, and he knows it almost as soon as he's spoken her name. The woman bears an uncanny resemblance to Fanny Braun, true, but only if Miss Braun were drowned and then dredged up after a fortnight pickled in the ocean's brine, and then drowned and recovered again for good measure. Where Fanny's dun tresses would be, instead a damp tack of black kelp ropes from her scalp and coils round her throat. In lieu of blue eyes are a set of milky marbles, pupil and iris alike devoured by cataracts. But it's the woman's teeth that most consume the poet's attention and stoke his awe and terror, twin rows of dark emeralds. Her breath is the sea's breath. John Keats At last you see me. His words catch in his throat and turn to a violent cough. The pain is brief and hot as a surgeon's spirit flame. When he has recovered, he replies, You know me, and yet I do not know you, miss. Tut, tut, the woman says, and her finger brushes the sleeve of his shirt, and through the fabric he feels a chill that pierces to his bone, and a dampness that sods the cloth fast to his skin. He's a feckless lover to the last who will not see his bride. My... my bride? John looks to the sailors, and they do not acknowledge him at all this time, their eyes on the ocean. In your way you've loved me. And should I not love thee in turn, my endymion? 
Or are you lovesick Porphyro? Or are you the gallant knight at arms, or perhaps the wretched wight? Her voice is playful, girlish. It is Fanny's voice, and yet not. He steps away, but the woman matches his retreat with a commensurate advance. Now, see here, good woman, he begins, addressing her as he might a troublesome hawker on a London street. But she cuts him off, arresting the speech from his throat with a wave of her hand. No, little poet, let's not bandy in common speech. Where is your lovely poetry for me now? You who called me now more than ever rich. Did you know, little poet, that no one has ever called me easeful before you? I watched you as you doted at your brother's sickbed, and even as I breathed him into me, it was you I wanted, you I longed for, beautiful, sad, vain, precious, guileless poet, you who bled upon the page, and you whose name is ever writ in water. Her brine breath, the clammy air from her skin, the enfolding presence of her shadow, the stench of the ocean's deep slime and old sludge, all of it oppresses him, and he feels incapable of retreat or diversion. He feels himself the sunflower anchored by the tether of the sun's attention, only there is no warmth in her pallid splendor. He knows he must escape her. He knows somehow that to be drawn in nearer, to fall into her embrace, will be a terminal adventure. He wants to call to the sailors for help, but his words fail him and as he tries to force breath from the flute of his throat, the pain gathers again and he sputters and coughs, ejecting a spatter of blood upon the woman's face. She does not even blink. I can stop it, you know. I can deliver you from the twin agonies that circle you like Nimrod's hounds, worrying with their teeth upon your every moment. He believes her. He knows in fuller measure than he has ever known anything in his brief gasp of a life that she is telling the truth. To fall into splendid dreaming. To sink into the purple draught of the sea. To cast himself into her embrace, accept her touch and be translated from all waking pain to an Ophelian serenity. To the anonymous property and numbing vintage of the deep. And now she holds a hand to him. An Italian winter will not save you. You know this. You have seen too much, learned too much from your anatomist's books and the unhappy tack of your life. Why prolong our flirtation? Why not swoon to me? He holds a living hand to hers, and she does not grasp it but waits for him to lace his fingers through hers. But he hesitates. And then a voice calls to him from behind, one of the sailors, a Norwegian. Hey, Londoner! The sailor taps his briar pipe on the railing and glowers, as if he'd very much prefer not having to leap into the water to rescue a consumptive passenger. The woman is gone and John stands athwart the gunwale of the bow-deck. His hands grasp the railing, while one of his feet dangles over the other side. Oh, he says. Suddenly he is flooded with the all-too-familiar toxin of embarrassment. He climbs down from the gunwale, his face flushed. I rather forgot myself there for a moment. It was, he decides, a passing vision, a trick of the night. The sailors shake their heads and go back to their watch. On the horizon, the coming dawn is a tenuous froth of blue. When John returns to the cabin, the captain is gone, likely having left for the morning watch. Mrs. Pigeon snores, and poor Joseph is awake, sitting up in his cot. Are you all right, old fellow? Joseph whispers. The sea is as yet flat, John answers. As John climbs into his little nook, Miss Cottrell begins to cough. Her fit is mercifully short, and when it ends, she speaks. 
Did you see him too? She asks. John doesn't answer, presuming Miss Cottrell is only babbling in her sleep. And yet he's sure he feels her eyes through the dark. Did you see him, Mr. Keats? She whispers. Oh, he was so lovely, so kind, and he spoke so softly to me. I know not of whom she speaks, Joseph says. We received no visitors. None, anyway, that a man of health could perceive. John will see the woman again, standing on the docks of Naples as he endures the stale heat and squalor of a ten-day quarantine in the port. He will see her on the hills of Lazio during the arduous carriage ride to Rome, and he will see her in the Eternal City as well, first as the shape that adumbrates the threshold of his little apartment, then as the shadow that flickers over his sickbed as his lungs dissolve, and finally, when all poetry has fled, then at last he accepts her hand, her kiss, with the rapture of a mercy long deferred. It is said that death is gentle. The poet Keats made his rendezvous in the eternal city of Rome at only twenty-five years of age, the last of which was spent in the painful decline of tuberculosis. Strange to think that such a famous name had a career for only four years. It seems that death has been shadowing us all for these past two years. It will come for us all in the end. Hopefully, in a guise which is pleasing to us. Hmm? Have I ever met death? Well, that would be telling. However, one does not grow as old as I without having made some sort of... Arrangement. I shall tell you about that sometime, but first, I must say that this evening's reader was David Alt, a voice actor from North Yorkshire, UK. He started voice acting with Darker Projects in 2005, moving through the Byron Chronicles, Pendant Audio, and Colonial Radio Theatre, to modern day antics with Fool and Scholar. The No Sleep podcast team and Shadows at the Door, the podcast. He is a big fan of tea, ghosts, and astronomy, and can be found online at David Alt on Twitter or davidalt.co.uk. And dear me, look at the time. You should be on your way. Might I suggest you do not speak to any attractive strangers who might tarry along your path this evening, just in case. Do take care out there, and come visit us next time at the Gallery of Curiosities. Gallery of Curiosities is produced under a Creative Commons International 4.0 non-commercial attribution no derivatives license. Story copyrights remain with the authors. Our theme song is Ashes Ashes by Deus Ex Vapora Machina. This episode was produced in March of 2022. For full show notes, visit us online at gallerycurious.com.